Right, so hi everyone, I'm Timothy, and I'll just be giving a short talk about how we can use Docker and Kubernetes to simplify machine learning development, be it like, you know, like models or like applications. So just before we begin, just a short about me. So I'm Timothy, I'm a current undergrad at SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design. It's not a private uni, it's a government uni. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the fourth autonomous public university in Singapore, so just to clarify things. Yeah, and I'm also an intern at NVIDIA. Right. So if you have any questions about this talk, can fire me an email and my email address over there. And I think I'll share my slides on the Meetup page as well. Yeah, I'll just wait five seconds for people to take photo. Okay, okay. Yeah, so just a very brief outline. Um, I'm just not going to assume that everyone here is familiar with like machine learning or deep learning. So I'll just do a short like two slide introduction. And then I'll talk about what makes machine learning development so annoying and how we can use Docker and Kubernetes to basically simplify the process a lot. Yeah, so just to clear up some terminologies. So artificial intelligence is a general field in computer science that is central around basically, you know, how do we make machines smart and perform actions without needing, you know, a lot of hum human intervention. So one subfield of artificial intelligence is called machine learning, which I'll uh, elaborate a bit more about in the next slide. And then yet another um, subfield of machine learning, which has gotten popular in like the 2012 onwards, is a field called deep learning. So just to give the general idea behind machine learning, machine learning is the idea that instead of handcrafting rules for like a program, we have certain algorithm that's able to discover these rules from the data. So another way of putting it is that machine learning is a way for us to solve problems without explicitly knowing how to create the solution. So there are some small problems with this. One of them is perhaps sometimes we not, may not always understand the solution or that the rules may not always be interpretable. So this is a problem in certain industries such as finance, where there's a need to justify the decisions that you know, maybe an agent or a company is making. So deep learning is just a subset of machine learning that's basically centered around things like deep neural networks. And these are the things that we need a lot of computational power to train. So that's where GPUs come in. But when we use GPUs for development, it can get quite annoying. So this is something that you know, people tend to experience when they first begin their foray into like, you know, developing like machine learning or deep learning applications. So the first step is you realize you kind of need like NVIDIA drivers and the CUDA toolkit. So you search online, there's like multiple different blog posts, each giving a slightly different approach on how to install and what they think, you know, works. And then you go to the NVIDIA website and there's four different installers for like four different OS. And then you need to choose the version and you're not sure, you know, whether or not you want to download the run file or the dev file and all that. Yeah, so it's really annoying. And then after that, you try to install a library and then you realize, you know, you need cool DNN or NCCL. And then after that, everything works, but you do a sudo app get upgrade and then everything breaks because your drivers were not installed with DKMS. So it's a lot of issues like that, that really drive people nuts. It drove me nuts also. Yeah, and then after that, after all the drivers and toolkit, everything is done, then, you know, we go and pip install our framework and then we realize that we have the wrong version of CUDA for the framework. And then we just, you know, go back to square one and then at the end, after you start working on another project or like a new project, and then you realize that, hey, you know, um, I'm supposed to use TensorFlow 1.08 because that's what the previous developer used. And that, re that requires me to like revert my version of CUDA. So that brings you back to square one again. So this is really, really very annoying. So this is sort of where like, you know, NVIDIA tries to push like DGX products, but DGX products, as we know, are really quite expensive and not suitable for everyone. So, you know, from one student or like from one enthusiast to another, I'm just here to share, you know, how you can make this process a lot easier. Yeah. And I mean, another contributing factor to this problem is that a lot of people develop using their system Python or their system environment. So this means that you're using like the Python that's installed on your Fedora or your Ubuntu installation, that like Python 3.5 or whatever, and use it to develop applications. So there's no reason why it shouldn't work but it also could open you up to potential li potentially little mistakes. So for example, if you go and search on forums and Reddit and so on, you get a lot of people complaining like, you know, they need Python 3.6 for development. So they uninstall their system 3.5 and they install 3.6 and then GNOME breaks or like YUM breaks or some nonsense like that. Yeah. And last but not least, like being dependent on your system environment, where it's probably very different from person to person, workstation to workstation server to server and so on, it really opens you up to this syndrome where, you know, something works on your machine and then you transfer it to someone else, you, maybe you have a requirements file and all that, but it still doesn't work. And it's really very hard for you to troubleshoot because there's just too many variables in place. So one way that we can go about to, you know, really solve this problem is to use a package manager like Conda, 
So Conda is very popular in the machine learning community because it can manage like virtual environments and also manage a lot of libraries. And um, contrary to popular belief, Conda is not just a package manager for Python. Conda can also manage system libraries such as like Zlib or whatever. So basically, um, Conda also has a very powerful dependency solver. So basically, you can specify, you know, like I just need all these packages and which versions. And Conda, it might take a while, like you'll, sp you'll like spin and give you this solving dependency screen for quite long. But Conda will eventually solve and give you the environment that you want. So Conda is still is pretty good, but Conda is still not 100%, especially when it comes to when there are system libraries involved. And Conda is still like annoying sometimes. So just some small downsides to, you know, Conda. So the, the main thing is that, you know, you still need to basically, let's say when you're onboarding a new team member, or like when you're setting up a new workstation or anything, there's still that manual step involved where you need to install Conda, um, you need to figure out the correct environment to install, and then sometimes Conda really, really takes very, very long to install and configure the environment if you have like huge list of like requirements and all that. And also because you're relying on people to write this um, Conda requirements, it's usually like this um, YAML file. Um, if the requirements are not specified properly, they can still break over time because basically every time you set up the Conda environment, it's downloading the packages according to the constraints that you provide. And sometimes if the constraints are not tight enough, you might be downloading a different set of packages and then your things still break. And last but not least, so this is a little bit strange, but there are a few people where you go there and tell them that, you know, use Conda, use virtual environments and all that, and then they really get very freaked out and they're like, I don't want to like, you know, activate environments and stuff like that. It's also complicated. So they just revert back to using their system Python. So these are a couple of things that basically got me thinking, how do we, you know, create and distribute an environment that is like really 99.9% predictable, portable, and also very easy for people to use. So this is where containers come into play. So basically a container, you can kind of think of it as something like a virtual machine, but not really. So the idea behind a container is that, you know, you basically have an entirely isolated and self-contained environment that basically already has all the files and stuff installed and it's basically it cannot be modified after it has been built as an image. So basically, once one person has validated that this container works, he knows that he can basically preserve and then continue to distribute this container without the need to worry that, you know, it works today, it might not work like maybe six months later and so on. So containers are really, really very deterministic. If it works now, then it probably will work forever. Unless you get some ex really external issues, like maybe like you get IP ban or something. But those are things that are really, really very external. The container itself will basically be preserved. And one nice side thing about using containers is that basically versioning comes pretty naturally. So every time you build a container, you basically are supposed to assign a version tag to it. So this basically allows you to keep track of all the environments that you're distributing very naturally. And let's say if something really goes wrong with an environment that you distribute, it's very clear to tell someone like, okay, you know, revert to this version of the container and everyone will understand what that means. And let's say if you control some kind of central environment, you can also update this container behind the scenes. And as long as everyone is pulling, you know, like the latest version of container from like a local repository or something, they're always getting that same container. So it helps a lot with like standardizing environments. So the only small thing about containers is that you must ask someone to install the container runtime, such as Docker. And then, but that's usually like a small thing. Right. So now I just want, just want to talk about NVIDIA Docker. So NVIDIA Docker is just a sort of a runtime layer over the Docker runtime. So basically what NVIDIA Docker does is it allows your Docker container to be able to access the GPU. So this is really very crucial because often for like machine learning or deep learning applications, we really want to access the GPU. If not, then there's no point in us writing the application. So for the default Docker runtime, you actually can't access hardware devices such as the GPU. And that's why NVIDIA created a special NVIDIA runtime for Docker that will basically map the host kernel modules that are responsible for GPU communication to inside the container so that whatever application is running inside the container, it basically talks to the GPU as if it was, you know, running on a machine and the GPU was directly attached to the machine. So it's a really transparent and really high performance way of doing this because in this case, there is no uh, virtualization involved. There's no virtual machine. Because for a virtual machine, basically what you need to do is that you need your hypervisor to be able to do what we call a PCI pass-through into the virtual machine. And that actually has a performance impact because the hypervisor layer is basically trying to um, simulate this um, PCI connection into the virtual machine. 
So doing it through Docker is a lot more higher performance and higher efficiency. And one last thing that um, people don't really realize is that you can actually still achieve a certain level of isolation by selectively attaching certain GPUs to basically whatever container they are running. So it's this small command over here, like somehow this is like not very well known. So basically you can do this and the container that you run will only be able to see basically the sixth and seventh GPU on your machine. Yeah, the numbering starts from zero because computers. Yeah, so I just want to share about this um, small side project that I've been working on over the last few months. So basically this is a all-in-one AI development and rapid prototyping container with basically everything pre-installed and pre-configured. So just a legal disclaimer because um, I have to do this. So this is not an official NVIDIA product offering. There's no warranty. If you use it to build kind and then robots kill everyone, it's entirely your fault. Yeah. Right, so basically um, the reason why I started with this project was because I had access to like shared GPU servers, but I couldn't really find a pre-made container that did like what I really wanted, which was, you know, I just wanted a Jupyter Notebook server. I didn't want to think too much about packages or configuration or all that. I just wanted to start something with like one line and then be able to do whatever I want without thinking about, you know, whether or not I was missing dependencies or things like that. So for this, um, there's also something else called uh, NGC containers. So NGC is basically NVIDIA GPU Cloud. For those of you who are working in uh, HPC space, you have probably heard of this. So these are, these are all um, NVIDIA validated containers that are designed for HPC workloads. So basically, they already contain a pre-validated and performance-optimized version of, say, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And then basically, you just load in your script, and then you can run it in a HPC environment. But this wasn't really suitable for like rapid iteration or prototyping because it lacks things like Jupyter. It may lack some library that you want, like maybe some natural language processing or some computer vision library. So that was also quite annoying. And then there are quite a few containers on Docker Hub, but a lot of them are like really questionable and like like not updated for the past six months and there's no GitHub repository so you can't like look at the Docker file and like maybe build your own version on that and things like that. And last but not least, I also wanted something that worked with Jupyter Hub. So this is something that I'll elaborate on later. But so basically I realized that a lot of people basically share this same problem, which is why I decided to try and build something that will be beneficial to everyone. Yeah. So just a bit of um, more elaboration. So basically this container works out of the box. There's no need to like go through any additional steps or configurations. Basically you launch a container and it's working. So I'll demo this later, hopefully. Yeah. And basically it includes most uh, machine learning and deep learning frameworks that people are you know, likely to use. So, you know, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, so and so on. So uh, personally, I tried my best to validate that everything is working, but you know, no guarantees. And also, um, we are not, as in this image is not being based on any of the NGC images because even though um, it's quite attractive to be able to use like, you know, a validated version of a validated binary for like TensorFlow or PyTorch and all that, um, we are not actually allowed to redistribute uh, NGC content. So um, we're not touching that. And yeah, so basically this is a personal um, preference and I think a lot of people share it. So basically the container boots you straight into like a Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab environment with like some useful extensions for Jupyter Notebook and so on. So this was something that a lot of people have feedback to me it was very useful. Yeah. And last but not least, like for the diehard command line people, you can of course continue to access it through the command line interface. Yeah. So basically um, if you use Jupyter Lab, the it, the um, CLI is actually pretty good. So I'll just demo this later. I, ho I hope it works. Yeah. So um, anyway, just a short overview of the libraries that I have basically sort of tested and basically make sure that it's more or less working. Your basic data science libraries, pandas, numpy, so on. Uh, deep learning libraries, including fast AI, if people want to follow that course. As well as some like newer libraries like AutoKeras, which are really very interesting. So AutoKeras basically is an implementation of a neural architecture search algorithm for Keras. So basically it means that you know, given a data set and a type of problem, like this library will figure out what is the ideal neural network structure for your model. Yeah. And um, we also include Rapids. So Rapids is something that NVIDIA has pushed out over the last few months. And I think a lot of people might not be very sure what Rapids is. I wasn't very sure at first or so. So Rapids is basically a, a reimagining of some popular data science libraries for it to run entirely on GPUs. So basically CoolDF is like Pandas but on GPU and CoolML is like Scikit-learn but on GPU. So what this means is that previous algorithms which might have been bottlenecked by your CPU speed are no longer bottlenecked and everything is being shifted to the GPU for processing. And the cool thing about CoolDF is that 
NVIDIA are trying to push it as a sort of like a standard. So for example, if you would like to do your pre-processing in QDF or like some other application that is compatible with QDF, like maybe XGBoost, and then maybe have a second stage of your pipeline or training that's using another library that's compatible with QDF. Basically, the data stays within the GPU memory without needing to be copied out into like, like the disk or the RAM and then copy it back into the GPU. So this is a problem that you know, people will face. Like you know, now, let's say you are using XGBoost, the data is only copied in the GPU memory when the XGBoost training is being done, and then it's copied back into the RAM for use in another framework. But with QDF, everything can stay within the GPU memory. Yeah, then some other like, you know, standard stuff like OpenCV and all that. Yeah, then where possible, we try to install a more performance-optimized version of the libraries. Like for example, Pillow is a very popular Python image loading library. But what people don't realize is that there's actually a performance optimized version of Pillow called Pillow SIMD. So we also install that. And that basically takes more advantage of like, you know, the extra instruction sets in your modern Intel CPUs like AVX2 and so on for faster things like, you know, faster JPEG decoding and things like that. Yeah, so in terms of support and stability, um, what I can say is that a couple of friends and I basically use it daily and on GeForce cards. So it works on GeForce cards, yeah. But if you use it for business, um, not a good idea to use GeForce cards. But anyway, yeah, so um, it works on GeForce cards. Uh, and, um, so within SUTD, we have a couple of GPU servers. So there are also um, various students and researchers who are using it for a wide variety of projects on GPU servers. And basically, in, like, in terms of the environment that we have tested this container in, we have used it with like, pure Docker, we have used it with Kubernetes, we have used it with both DGX and non DGX servers, as well as Quadro workstations. So pretty much, all the use cases that we would expect. In terms of cloud, we have tested it on EC2 um, Google Compute Engine as well as Google Kubernetes Engine. And then along the way, because this project has been running for a few months, like I have made enhancements and fixes based on feedback. So I believe that we come out with a very good like sort of product here. And then uh, last but not least, we also have like a more larger use case where um, we conducted a deep learning workshop in SUTD with a class of 40 students on a GKE cluster and we basically had a in our sense, this is our largest deployment so far of this setup, Kubernetes with this container, and then it works fine. So with this, we were, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, um, just to talk a bit about the roadmap for this project. So basically, um, I'm still validating uh, multi-GPU and multi-node training. So multi-GPU is working fine. So here, um, you can see that I've been successfully running training with up to four GPUs. So that's about the limit at which I have tested. And next on my list is basically I want to validate Horovod and open MPI performance. So this is basically uh, more requested from like the uh, university side or like HPC spaces where they really want to deploy something like this on GPU clusters. And for that multi-node performance is actually very crucial. So we're looking into things like Horovod to see if um, we can get everything validated to be working properly. And also another interesting thing that has like popped up is people have been asking, can you like basically run um, applications that involve the open AI gym inside for reinforcement learning? So that's something that I'm also looking into. Yeah, so basically the source code is available on GitHub. I'll come back to this slightly later, I think. Okay, so um, here is when I'm gonna try to do the demo. But if you notice me panicking at the start just now, that's because I forgot to set up the demo. So um, let's see if my rush setup in front works. So um, I think I accidentally demonstrated how fast it is to set up because when I was standing up here, I was setting up the environment. Okay, so my first demo here is I have a brand new um, Google Cloud um, virtual machine. So basically all I've done is, yeah? Sorry? Oh, zoom in, okay. Yeah, so basically um, all I've done previously to this demo is I basically just run a script to install the CUDA drivers and Docker toolkit and all that. And so basically um, I can start the container with just one single line of command. So it's basically this command over here. Yeah, but I'm trying with a new version. But anyway, it's this command. So basically it's just docker run, then I map the port and I map a folder into the container, and then you'll immediately start in a Jupyter notebook. So I'm just gonna try and open it in the browser now. So it's your standard procedure where you just go to the IP address and connect to the port. Yeah, hopefully it works. Okay, yeah, it works. So I'll just copy the um, token over. Yeah, so now I have a fully configured Jupyter environment on a completely fresh machine. So if I try and do something now, like, you know, maybe I want to import 
TensorFlow, no import PyTorch, and like maybe import one of the Rapids library, import CoolDF, and <gasps> okay, so it's a bad like it's a bad idea to try a new version of the container. Okay, I was trying this because like I built a smaller version that should have pulled faster. So the small problem here about using Google Cloud to demo is that the this I/O performance is really very bad. So um, it takes a while to extract. So okay, we come back to this later. Yeah, I forgot to pray to the demo gods today. Yeah. Okay, so basically, um, okay, so it works. The only reason why it didn't work was I decided to pull a new version that I haven't fully tested. Yeah, so later we'll go back to the working version. So the next question that we ask ourselves is, you know, how can we scale this environment to like an undeterminate number of users? Like for example, during the workshop when we have like 14 users and they're all beginners. So how can we do it? So for this, I decided to be a bit more, um, convert, like, um, I decided to be a bit safer and show a video demo. Yeah, I actually have the Kubernetes cluster running in the background. But I'm just going to show the video first because there's a chance that that doesn't work. Because I rushed to set it up just now also. Okay, let me just try playing. Yeah, so basically, um, what the users get during the workshop is that they basically log in using a Google... Okay, let me just full screen, yeah. So basically, they log in using a um, Google, Google account, and they are, then they are directed to this spawning page. So what they can do is they just specify the um, template Docker image, they specify the uh, CPU and RAM resources that they want, and then the number of GPUs, and then they'll be able to spawn their Jupyter Notebook server. So it's as easy as clicking spawn, and then they will get their Notebook server in like around 10 to 20 seconds. So this is obviously sped up. So basically what they can do is, they can go to the command line, I'm just gonna skip forward a bit, and then they can clone the, like clone the workshop material in our case. And then they're able to browse the workshop material as usual, like just using Jupyter Notebook, and display and run the notebook and the training and all that. Yeah. So basically, um, the reason why we went ahead with this was because um, during the workshop, we didn't want to fiddle around with like making sure everyone had the packages and all that installed on their computer. So we shifted everything to Google Cloud. Yeah. So basically, um, this is what I was saying. So basically, we had like around 40 participants, and all of them had access to their own dedicated Jupyter Notebook server and GPU to run all the workshop material at like absolutely zero setup on their laptop, other than needing a web browser. Yeah. So basically, this was done using an open source project called Kubeflow. So basically, Kubeflow is a machine learning toolkit for Kubernetes that aims to cover this entire end-to-end -end pipeline of development to deployment and management of like machine learning environment and applications. Yeah, so basically um, the Kubeflow website is kubeflow.org and basically what it does is that it sources for all the best um, open source machine learning projects and basically just make, combines it into one giant toolkit that's designed to run on Kubernetes. Yeah, so basically I tried it on on-prem and on Google Cloud and it works very well. In fact, on Google Cloud, there's actually a entirely GUI like deployment tool where you really just click a button and it deploys this cluster for you. So that's quite amazing. Yeah. So some of the other stuff that, yeah? So, so for the 40 people, right, do you have uh, a separate instance for all of them? Okay, so no. So for the 40 users, eight users were sharing one instance, but yeah, to save money. But basically to the users, they have no idea what's happening in the background because this is all abstracted away from them. Yeah, so I'll elaborate a bit more about this later, yeah. Yeah, so um, other than being able to deploy Jupyter Notebook environments using Jupyter Hub, Kubeflow is also capable of other things, such as distributed batch jobs. So that's where things like Horovod get interesting. Uh, you can do like model serving using uh, TensorRT or Seldon or TF serving and so on. So you can see that this really covers this end-to-end -end machine learning development pipeline, where you go from experimentation to like large-scale training to like actual production deployment. So Kubeflow aims to cover this entire pipeline. Yeah, okay, so I sort of mentioned this already. So this is the entire pipeline that Kubeflow attempts to address. Yeah, so everything from experimentation in Jupyter to training at scale to building your actual model server and application and then operating it in a production environment. Yeah, so the next thing about Kubeflow is that this is not some random like side project like mine. Kubeflow is actually a very huge project with contributors from Intel, Google, uh, Microsoft and NVIDIA. So the interesting development that happened like a few days ago is that Intel actually released a commercial product that is based on Kubeflow but without Jupyter support, I mean without GPU support, which actually makes zero sense. But I think they're trying to desperately protect their market. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is sort of like the contributor breakdown for Kubeflow. So you can also see that there's a couple of Chinese um, companies here as well. So there's also there's a lot of widespread interest in Kubeflow in China as well, from companies like um, Alibaba, and I think this is um, one of the universities in China. Yeah. And then of course, the main driver of the project is Google as always. Yeah. So um, I'm just not sure if everyone here is familiar with Kubernetes. So basically, I think I mentioned it previously. So Kubeflow is basically a toolkit that runs on top of Kubernetes. And what Kubernetes does is that it basically, to put it simply, it manages starting and stopping sets of containers. So you can imagine it as sort of like a automation. And yeah, so basically it's like an automation framework for containers. And basically what it does is it can also manage resources like compute, um, load balancing, networking, and storage. So to answer the previous uh, gentleman's question, so basically what happens in the back end when users request the Jupyter Notebook server is that all the, Kub the, the Kubernetes master will get is that you know, I need one CPU core, five gigs of RAM, and a K80 GPU. And then the Kubernetes engine will basically figure out, you know, which node out there has these resources. And then the user's port will automatically be spawned on that node, completely transparent to the user. And it happens really, really very fast. Yeah. And for people who are interested to learn more about Kubernetes, there's this video that sounds like, there's this video that has a really weird title. The Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes, but this is actually a really, really, really good video if you have completely no idea what is Kubernetes. So yeah, just check it out. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to the demo. Yeah. Wait. Okay, yeah, I think it's successfully pulled, so I'm just gonna try opening it up again. Okay, so let's try that again. Hopefully it works. Okay, wait, I'm not entirely sure what's wrong. Okay, so this is a very bad demo. Okay, let me switch to the Kubernetes one. I just need the endpoint. I forgot what's the endpoint. Yeah, okay, so I'm in. Yeah, okay, so basically that spawner that you saw during a video was like a customized version. So this is the vanilla version that you get with um, the Kubeflow deployment. So I'm just, okay, so what I realized is that I also forgot, I, I didn't pull down the container for this. So it's gonna spawn, but it will just take very long to spawn, yeah. So um, actually, maybe we just conclude it here. Then if I can successfully download the container, then I'll show again after the second talk maybe. Yeah, but for now, I'll just take questions. Yeah, yes? How is it compared to using and using the Google's collab down on Google.com collaborator? Because collaborator also supposed to be your GPU board, and you have a whole Jupyter notebook, and you can write your code directly in, on the Google infrastructure, you don't use it up anything. Yeah, okay, so the main difference between this and collab is that basically you can run this on-prem. So firstly, it like for some people, they actually care a lot about running things on-prem because maybe their data is sensitive. And then the next thing is that um, this is actually a lot more high performance than Colab. So basically for Colab, you don't actually like get a lot of things, like you don't really get a persistent environment. You get a 12 hour limit and you also get like somewhat throttled CPU and GPU performance. And you also cannot customize the environment that comes out of Colab. So basically, if, let's say you are conducting a class in a university, you cannot customize a Jupyter Notebook deployment for that class with all the modules pre-installed. And you basically need that one cell at the top of your Colab Notebook with a lot of boilerplate code for like basically downloading packages and all that. And you're basically at Google's mercy for what, um, whether or not certain things are supported. Yeah, so um, Colab actually has this local runtime thing, but I admit that I haven't really tried the local runtime for Colab. Yeah. Because it's free. That's yeah, right, right. So that's Colab that's is. To putting up so much infrastructure, I think you can practice with that and then come to this infrastructure once you're okay with it. Right? Yes, correct. So and another thing is, like, for example, universities tend to have things like GPU clusters that are already there, but undergrad students hate those clusters because you need to use things like Slurm to like submit your job and all that. So another reason why we came up with this was so that we can convert those clusters to something that's a lot more user friendly. And one thing that you, I'm, okay, I'm not sure if you can do this with the Colab local instance, is that you can run more than one GPU. Yeah. So it's things like that. How much is the cost for building up your cluster for your students? 
yeah okay so that um 40 gpu cluster costs about um i forgot how much it was i think it was like it was less than 100 a day yeah and basically um google is very supportive about these kind of things so they basically sponsor outright for us to run the workshop on google cloud yeah so i think another okay wait, so yeah so the guy yeah Yeah, so basically this was a very bad demo because I literally was setting it up the 10 minutes that I was here because I forgot about it. Yeah, so um, the idea here is that um, if you have a, already have like a cluster where the image is already loaded, then it's easier to direct everyone to just use that one central image. And this also covers each cases where, you know, users are trying to port one framework, like a project in one framework to another framework, or maybe they are just using it for experimentation and testing out the code that they, they are getting from the internet. And then one more thing I realized is, actually I did try to build a, like some variants of the container, but what I realized was that the, um, the base image, which is basically the NVIDIA CUDA image, with like your base um, notebook installation and your base Python installation, and then you add on one framework, that, was, that comes up to more than half of the size of this overall container that I made. Yeah, so in terms of a, so I was, I was trying to come up with a certain balance, so I think that especially for image that's meant for like a central deployment. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to just have one image because it's easier to manage. And also, um, yeah, at Google Cloud really has quite poor IO performance. So it downloads really fast, but then it takes super long to extract for some reason. Yeah, so that, that was the only annoying thing about using Google Cloud. But if you do it on your own computer, it takes like several, several times faster. Like Google Cloud's performance when extracting the image is an anomaly, I feel, yeah. So maybe, yeah. Oh yes, okay, so I forgot to demo this, but um, basically it's on the documentation page for the um, container as well. So I have another like random site project. So basically um, what this is, is that um, this is a one-liner for installing um, the CUDA toolkit Docker as well as NVIDIA Docker. So um, this is basically something that I've again also crafted over the past few months as I slowly figure out what is the best way to install the CUDA toolkit basically in a way that will not break like after app get installs and all that and works across like workstations and servers and so on. Yeah, so again, this thing has like absolutely no warranty, but it has worked so far across many different environments. Yeah. But how do you solve the problem that you protect different versions? Ah, yes. Yeah. So basically, the, um, the thing about using a Docker container is that your version of CUDA inside the container does not need to match the version of CUDA in your system. So your worst case scenario is that you need to build another version of the container with the correct CUDA driver, I mean with the correct CUDA toolkit inside the container, but basically whatever CUDA toolkit or driver that you're running on your system doesn't actually matter unless it's like too old, for example. So there's that layer. So basically you don't need to deal with the actual machine itself and you only need to deal with the container, which makes it a lot easier because Sometimes when you try to upgrade or downgrade the CUDA version on the machine itself, like it somehow breaks and then you need to like reformat the machine and start from scratch. Yeah, so sometimes that does happen. I'm sorry, can you like rephrase your question? I didn't quite catch it. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that um, if you have very specific requirements, like maybe you need CUDA 8.0, um, it's okay if, like for example, CUDA 10 is installed on the machine itself, as long as your container was built for CUDA 8. So in that sense, like for example, if you have, you have, you have several projects, so one project is using CUDA 9, one project is using CUDA 8, as long as all your machines have like maybe CUDA 10 installed, your projects will run fine on all the machines as long as you have a Docker image which has like CUDA 8 or CUDA 9 installed inside the Docker image. 
So basically, you don't have this complexity on needing to manage the version of CUDA that's actually installed on your server. You just need to manage that Docker image and then distribute the Docker image. Yeah, uh, one last question. Yeah, yes. sorry. Uh, I thought that Kubeflow came with uh, an actual Docker container specification, or am I saying correct? Or yeah, that interaction. All right. So, um, okay. So I guess I forgot to mention that. But basically, um, okay. So basically, for your container to work with Jupyter Hub, which is basically the same thing as what um, Kubeflow bundles. Your Docker container basically needs to have certain packages and a specific entry point that is being configured. So as long as your container has that, you can use it with like Kubeflow or Jupyter Hub. So they bundle their own version of a TensorFlow container. And basically what I've done is that I tried to build on top of that to include stuff that I feel that people commonly needed but was missing from the container itself. But either way, um, any container that is built specifically to include all these Jupyter packages and the entry point will work with any Jupyter Hub installation, be it any like a normal Kubeflow installation, a customized one, or like another version of Jupyter Hub and so on. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. That's yeah. It, right?